Hey, we want to welcome you to our Wednesday night teaching of just diving into God's Word here at Christian Life Center in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. It's turned a little bit cool here, and I thought I'd put on my comfortable hoodie and just share God's Word with you and encourage you. You know, the Apostle Paul said, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So as we get into the Word tonight, it's going to increase our faith and help us in our daily walk. So if you have a copy of God's Word there, I encourage you to take it, maybe a notepad and a pencil. Let's take some notes. Let's let's dive into this that it can apply to our lives and use it throughout the week. As you're doing that, let me mention just one thing to you very quickly. Uh, you know, of course, in the state of Pennsylvania and really around the nation, there are some uh, new restrictions that are rolling out for public gatherings. Uh, for us, fortunately, our uh, governor is still uh, very much aware that churches still need to meet together and be encouraged. We just have to do it safely. So one of the things we decided to do is in the month of December, the first Sunday in December, December the 6th, we're going to go to three services. We have two services now, and our congregation is doing very well. But we felt like if we go to three services, still gives us a little bit more room, and we're able to practice all the social distancing and uh uh, and so those three services now are going to be 8.30 to 9.30, 10 to 11, and 11.30 to 12.30. One of the new mandates here in the state of Pennsylvania is all indoor gatherings, you have to have a mask. Remember, let's don't let masks divide us, all right? If you wear a mask, we're just uh, being aware of those that are around us. We're not only protecting them, we're protecting ourselves. And so we want to serve one another that way. If you say, Pastor, I'm not going to wear a mask. We still have online. You can view online. Or you say, I'm not comfortable. You can still view online. Either way, let's don't let this divide us. We still want to come together. We still want to gather and celebrate Jesus together and see one another. So remember those new times starting December the 6th. They're 8.30 to 9.30. 10 to 11 and 11.30 to 12, okay? Hey, we're gonna jump right into God's word, but I wanna pray before we do. Lord, I pray that you would help us tonight. Uh, God, allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate the word to us. Holy Spirit, we just, we, we pray that. Illuminate the word so we can grab hold of it, so it makes sense to our lives, so we can apply it to our life and not merely hear the words, but that we would do what your word says to do. Uh, God, help us tonight. Speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of the things I've discovered about moving up to the Northeast, there's always a lot of road construction, always. Uh, every day I'm in road construction somewhere. Recently, I was out on Highway 1, and I had forgotten that they were shutting it down. And so I had to go through some back ways. Well, then I ran into another roadblock, another road construction. It seemed like every place I was turning, I was either running into traffic are running into another roadblock. I want to talk to you just a few minutes tonight about roadblocks to joy. Now, joy is different from happiness. And let me explain this. Um, joy is in the knowing. And, and I'll explain this in just a minute. Happiness is based on happenstance. So joy is the inward, okay, the internal, and happiness is basically the external. So in other words, if things are going well in my life and happenstance and all these things are in my life and, I, and I'm moved by emotion, that's more happiness. Joy is in the knowing. No matter what happens on the outside, I know that I'm okay. The Bible speaks about joy, the power of joy, the strength of joy. Even in the book of James, listen to what James chapter 1 and verse 2 says. This is the brother of Jesus. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. He said, consider it pure joy when you face these trials, because you know that it produces something in your life. So joy produces an anchor for our life, that I'm going to be okay. I thought about this way. Joy is fueled, actually this joy grows in our life by the knowing. In other words, that I'm in close relationship with the Lord, that I'm in his word daily, that I'm praying daily. 
that I'm focusing on the things of God. See, my joy begins to grow the more I'm around him because the more I'm around him, the less I'm controlled by my outside circumstances. In other words, the closer I am to him, the safer I feel because I know that it's going to work out. That's joy. That's what the Bible speaks of joy. The closer I am to the Father and the more I know his presence, the more I'm settled and I have joy in my heart. See, that's the internal. The external, all this is going out around me. And I've watched people, they're up and down like this all the time in their relationship with the Lord. And they've confused joy with happiness. Now, are we supposed to be happy? Yes, there are things that come in our life and we're happy and we're moved. And we're emotional creatures. We were created with emotions. But emotions can't drive us. Faith has to drive us. Faith is rooted in joy. I know that God is for me. You see, we begin to see his perspective, really not ours. When we see ours, we're moved by the emotion. When we see ours, we think of, we see our perspective. We think of everything that's happening right now. All the things that are happening in the world with the pandemic, and now there's a rise in COVID. The thing that amazes me right now, and I want to talk to you, I want you to listen to me very closely. I know there may be some distracting things going in your home right there, wherever you're viewing this. I want you to hear me. With everything that's going on in the world right now, do not become a person of fear. You're people of faith. If you're a believer in Jesus, Jesus has the ability and the integrity to take care of you. Okay, you don't have to be, uh, don't be moved by fear. I'm amazed at people that call themselves Christians that are overwhelmed by fear right now. Am I going to get COVID? If I get COVID, how sick am I going to get? Well, if I get sick, am I going to die? Listen to me. God can take care of you. That doesn't mean that we're not wise. That doesn't mean that we're not careful. That's not what I'm talking about. And don't confuse uh, what I'm saying here. You know whether you are living in fear or concern right now, because there's a big difference. I'm telling you, be a person of faith. The closer you get to Jesus... The closer you you get to the Father, the more you're in His Word, you'll become people of faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. You know what brings fear? Is the neglect of the Word. It always brings fear is when we neglect the Word. And you say, well, Pastor, I'm not really fearful. I'm just concerned. Well, you know the difference. There's a difference there. I'm concerned, but I'm not walking around all day long wondering, am I going to get sick? Am I cautious? Yes. Am I careful about the things I do? Yes, I use common sense. But I don't lay down at night and go, well, am I breathing right? Am I feeling okay? And allow that to control me. See, that's what fear does. Fear controls. Joy allows you to live and release those things to God. He's in control. I promise you God's in control. Listen to what Paul writes in the book of Romans chapter 15. In verse 13, about this joy we we talk about. It says, in Romans 15, 13, it says this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Listen to this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust. So there's uh, there's the phrase. As you trust in him, you'll have joy and peace so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember what hope is? Hope is an anchor for your soul. So peace and joy equal hope. It's a steadfast, it's strong, that no matter what happens, joy will keep you. You know, if I had to describe society today, I would look at a society society that is discontented and they're not satisfied. The total opposite of what joy brings. Joy tells me, that no matter what happens in this world, I'm going to be okay, and so I can rest. That's what joy tells me. It becomes an anchor that I hope not in the world system, that I hope not in what what maybe the government does, but my hope is in the Lord. Even the psalmist said, some trust in horse and chariot, but I in the name of the Lord. You see, horses and chariots was a sign of power. See, some people trust in this power that they have right in front of them or that we have a bigger economy or we have a bigger military. He said, but we trust in the name of the Lord. That brings joy because his kingdom 
never fails. Listen to what the Bible says about joy. In Philippians 4, it says that joy will give you peace. In 2 Corinthians 8, 2, that joy will cause you to be generous. What you think about that? When you're a joyful person, you want to be generous with your life. In James 1 and 4, joy brings perseverance. Listen to what the Bible says, even here in John 15 and 11. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you. Think about that, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete or whole or steadfast or not wavering. He said, the kind of joy I want to give you is the joy that's in me. Wow. And it will be complete, not lacking anything. See, Jesus, we know this, even though he struggled, even though he, he, he had tough, t- tough times on the outside, we know that he was content on the inside. We know this even when he sat with the disciples. Even when he broke bread with them, he broke the bread and he gave thanks. He gave thanks. Even So joy makes you look beyond what's going to happen and submit to the things of God. We see this in the Garden of Gethsemane where he says, Father, it's not my will, but it's your will that's important. Joy is an anchor for your life. Joy and peace equal hope. Hope is an anchor for our soul. Listen to what the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 21. It says, at the time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, I praise you, Father. No matter what's going on, when we're full of joy, full of the Holy Spirit, we can say, God, I praise you. You're in control. You're not out of control. I'm your child. I belong to you. And even though all these things are happening on the outside and my emotions could be pulled that I'm sad, that I'm overwhelmed, my hope is not in those things because those things won't last. My hope is in you and you are eternal. And yet joy is something According to the book of Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, joy is something that we have to work for in our life, that it's not easy. And what I mean by that is it takes effort on our part, what we would just call, in the, what the Bible describes as obedience, that we would be obedient. In other words, we would discipline ourselves to not be moved by what's happening on the outside. And let me just say this, the more you discipline yourself to the things of God, the more the Holy Spirit's going to help you. You say, well, pastor, is that really true? Well, I can just tell you, even from the Old Testament, what God spoke to Joshua, he said, every place you set your foot, I'll give you. Many of you have heard me describe this. Every place you set your foot, I'll give you. In other words, if you're committed to that step, if you're disciplined to take that step, he said, I will give it to you. If you are unwilling to take that step, God is unwilling to give it to you. Discipline. We discipline ourselves to say, I'm not going to be moved by this. We discipline ourselves to say, I'm going to stay in your word. As I stay in God's word, as I stay in his presence, this joy begins to well. You know why the joy wells up? Because I absolutely see that God is in control and he can take care of me. Why does joy well up? Because I see less of me and I see more of him. The more I'm in his word. And I'm not a downcast person. In other words, when I am disciplining myself, I'm aligning myself with the things of God. Have you ever noticed a person that is moved by their emotions or happenstance, those things that are happening? They're downcast many times. You know why? Because things around them are not going well. And so downcasts are actually looking down. You know why they're downcast? Is because they're looking at their situation more than they're looking at their God. When you look at your situation, when you look at everything around you and that becomes your focus, you will be downcast. But when you look at that and you frame it, that God, you are still in control and all of that, and you focus back on what his word says, that in this world, Jesus said, in this world, you'll have trouble, but be of good cheer. You got to read the second part. We get stuck on the first part, that in this world, I'm going to have trouble and we're downcast. But it's the second part that's so important. He said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer. In other words, don't be downcast. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. See, joy is knowing that the Savior that we serve and the Savior that keeps us 
is a Savior that's not going to abandon us. He's there for us. But one thing Satan wants to do, he wants to rob us of this joy. And as I started out, I talked about roadblocks, and I talked about all the hindrances that come sometimes. Well, I just thought about a couple of those traps. I thought about a couple of those traps that would steal our joy. And I want to just share those with you real quick. These are, it's really a good list for you that you can ask yourself these three questions or, or, or am I in any of these traps right now? Or is this a trap that the devil is laying? Here's the first trap that will steal your joy. The trap of disobedience. Of not being obedient, of just being disobedient. Probably one of the prime examples of this is really right from the beginning. Genesis chapter 3, the disobedience of Adam and Eve. They were disobedient. Think, I want you to think about this. Adam and Eve was enjoying perfect peace, joy. I mean, they had everything they needed. There was no sin in the world. So they, they weren't downcast. They enjoyed their day. They enjoyed one another. I mean, it was paradise. It literally, that's what it was. It was paradise until they were disobedient. God says, don't touch it. God said, don't touch it. Now that's mine. Don't touch that. As soon as they touched it and they were disobedient, sin entered the world. They had perfect joy. But as soon as they said, I know better than God, and they looked and they said, I'm going to take that, they lost their joy. They, I mean, they, they lost their joy. They are walking in God's presence, His fullness. They had everything that they needed. And their disobedience canceled it. Right now, some of you, you wonder why you're struggling so bad. You wonder why your life is in such chaos and such a mess. You wonder, God, why is it that I can't, it seems like I can't even, uh, it, it seems like I can't even move forward. It seems like when I begin to move forward, I'm disappointed. Ask yourself, have you been disobedient to the things of God? It will rob you of joy quicker than anything else. It's just being disobedient. No matter how good and harmless it may seem, if God says, don't do this, and you do it, guess what? You're going to reap what you sow. That's a principle in God's Word. It's, it's, the, it's the principle of reaping and sowing. And if you reap of the flesh... The Bible says, you, uh, if you sow in the flesh, you'll reap death. I want you to think about that for just a minute. Our decisions determine the joy in our life, the alignment. How are you aligning your life right now? Have you fallen into the trap of disobedience? And like, like Adam, even when we fall into disobedience, even when we fall and we're disobedient, and we feel this, many times we want to blame other people. Even Adam blamed Eve. He said, that woman you gave me, that's the reason I, I'm in the trouble I am. And nobody made him do that. You see, it's the trap of disobedience. You see, just like Adam, we want to blame others sometimes for our lack of joy and the misery we have in our life when we make that choice. I've often said this years ago when Christy and I first got married, many years ago, <laughs> I've always, I've said that, I've said this since the beginning, I can't determine all the things that are happening in my life on the outside, all the circumstances that Mark English run, I can't, I, when things are happening on the outside and they're coming towards me, I can't, I can't help a lot of those things. And I can't, do, but I can determine how I feel about the circumstance. I am in control of that. Friend, no one's in control of how you process things. Are you going to look at all of it and say, man, I don't know what to do? And you're going to be downcast. Or are you going to do like Jesus when he went to the tomb of Lazarus? When he, Lazarus had already been dead for a couple days. And everybody's crying said, if you'd have just gotten here earlier, he'd have been fine. The Bible, read it. The Bible says that Jesus lifted his eyes above the crowd. You know what he's saying? I'm not going to be downcast by this because I know who the Father is. And my joy is complete in him. See, Jesus said he wants to give you the same joy that he has. In other words, he's close to the Father, and the Father brings stability to our life. And sometimes we fall into the trap of disobedience, and it robs us for, uh, 
from that joy. Here's a second trap I'll tell you about, the trap of delay. That when God tells us to do something, we delay in it. Uh, Acts chapter 24 is a story here of Paul, the apostle Paul, and Felix. Listen to what it says here in Acts 24, 25. It says, as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave, and when I find it convenient, I will send for you. Paul was in prison in Caesarea, and Felix, Felix sent for him so that he might hear about Jesus. And listen to what the scripture says. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. I'll send for you when it's convenient. And it's interesting that that's in there because that's what we do sometimes. We say, God, this is just not a convenient time. I know you're calling me to do this. I know you want me to do this, but it's just not convenient right now. God, can we do this later on? God, I really want to be used of you, but I don't think I'm ready for this. And really what we're saying is, God, this is not a convenient time. And it's the trap of delay. How many times has the enemy told the person that sat in church or they sat with a friend and they felt conviction of their sin and they said, well, if I can just get out of here, I'll be okay. Or I know as a pastor, sometimes when I give the invitation for people to get saved, one of the things the enemy tells them is you're not that bad of a person. You don't need to do this right now. Let's don't do this right now. When you get everything fixed, then you can come back. You see, the biggest the biggest lie of the devil is tomorrow. I always say tomorrow is the devil's word. Let's do it tomorrow. Let's do it. Today is God's word. Today is the day of salvation. What we do is we delay. God wants us to do something and we delay. And you know what? God's saying, this is the moment for you. This is the moment. I need you to act now. And sometimes because we delay, that window of opportunity closes sometimes. And God's saying, I don't want you to delay. If you delay, it's going to rob you of that joy. I think about so many times in my life where I'm so thankful that I didn't delay. And man, I just felt so much joy that, that there was a situation that I acted in that moment. And God said, this is what I had for you. And because you did not delay, I'm going to give you the joy you need. And there have been other times I delayed and I wondered why I was so miserable. I mean, I knew. That delay, just like Felix, he said, I, it's not convenient right now. What are you saying even in your life right now? What are the things you've been telling God? Well, this is not a good time right now, God. I don't have all my affairs in order. You know what I found out? That even when God calls people to ministry, it's never had a convenient time. You know why? If it were convenient and you had everything together, you wouldn't need God. Those are moments of faith where God says, now. And we fall into those traps many times. And you know what it looks like? When we're delayed, when we, when we delay what God wants us to do, we start using these words, I wish. If only I would have done that. I know a number of people today that have delayed things in their life and they're not happy people. They're not joyful people. As a matter of fact, they're pretty miserable. And now the devil has even told them it's too late. And friend, if you've just delayed and you said it's just too late, I'm telling you today, quit listening to the word tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Just say, God, forgive me for delaying in my life. Forgive me for being disobedient. Forgive me for always looking for the most convenient outcomes rather than the faith outcomes. See, I, when I think of convenience, I think of comfort. The reason we have so many people that are fearful today, their comfort has been stolen from them. And they base their whole life around comfort rather than faith. All of us are guilty of this. We don't like being uncomfortable. And yet God says, this is faith. I was reading with the, with the staff this morning. We had staff devotion. And I was talking about when Moses even went before Pharaoh, he said, let my people go that they may go in the wilderness and worship me. I always found that interesting, that phrase, 
to go into the wilderness that they may, one translation says that they may have a festival, that they may worship. It's in those moments, it's in those moments where we have lost all of our comfort. It's in those moments that we've lost everything. If we will not delay and we will worship him, we'll, we'll be in obedience rather than disobedience. We will find a measure of God that we have uh, previously had never discovered and a joy, walk in a joy that we never had. It's in those moments. But the traps, the trap of disobedience, the trap of delay, and here's the last one, the trap of distress. In other words, fear. That we're so distressed. Listen to what Psalm 27 and verse 1 all the way to verse 6 says. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. And at his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy and I will sing and make music to the Lord. I love that, that David offered up sacrifice of joy. You know, he talks about here that he's surrounded, his enemies are surrounding, but he is confident that the Lord is with him. That he's confident that God will wage war on his behalf. He is confident that though the enemy may surround him, they will not overtake him. Now, why was he confident of that? I think that we have it right here at the last. He says, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. That even when I see all of this, regardless of how I feel, because the sacrifice is moving beyond your feelings. That's the sacrifice, is that I move beyond my feelings. That I walk into this place on a Sunday morning or wherever I'm at, maybe in the car, maybe at the house, and it's not been a good day that I still offer up a sacrifice of praise. That no matter what, that all of this distress in the world, all this fear right now, that it's not going to control me. You know why? Because even when I feel that distress coming on, that at that moment, rather than giving in to my feelings, which would be the easiest thing to do, I'm going to lift my head. I'm not going to be downcast, and I'm going to worship. And as I begin to worship, I get the perspective, God, you're in control. You're in control of all of this. Friend, I want to tell you that you have an enemy, and your enemy is not your friend. Your enemy is not your mate. That's not your enemy. The enemy of your soul is Satan. And what he's going to try to do is try to keep you from the things of God with everything he has. If it means that he'll tell you it's not that bad and you're disobedient, you're going to miss joy. If that means that, you know what, you don't have to do that right now. It, it's not that important. You can do that later on. That's delay. You'll miss joy that way. Or all these things are happening. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? What if the economy collapses? How are we going to pay this? How are we going to pay? And he gets you to focus on that so much that he robs you of joy. Joy is a much better way, but it's yours for the choosing. It's mine for the choosing. I want to encourage you, friend, today, wherever you find yourself, maybe you've been in disobedience, repent. Just say, God, help me. Maybe you've delayed. I want to tell you it's not too late. Repent. Maybe you've allowed fear to control you. Get so close to Jesus that you'll run fear out and love will control you. I love what Paul told Timothy, young Timothy. He said, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. You know, that sound mind is this, no matter what I go through, God, you're in control. Your love's greater than all the fear in this world. 
Friend, this is the gospel that is meant for us. Right there where you're sitting, what I have, what I've just spoken to you today, this gospel is for us to live as overcomers, to live with joy. Jesus has said, Jesus said, the same joy that I have, I want to give to you. And that joy is going to make your life complete. Friend, whatever's going on, just pause right now and just say, God, help me. I know there's a lot of things going on in this world and you could be overwhelmed by it. It's easy to get, I understand it's easy to get overwhelmed, but I want to assure you that God is for you. He's not against you and he wants to help you tonight. Lord, would you help all of us? God, we're living in what some people would say are very uncertain times, but to the life of a believer, this is very certain times because you're still in control. And God, I know this too, that every time there has been um, a place where the church is brought to an uncomfortable position, that's when faith would rise up and that's when you would see the church grow and do its best. That's when the life of the believer would do, uh, in the life of a believer would grow and do better than ever before, even in conflict. God, that's how you work. Because what happens is in those moments of conflict and crisis, when we look to you, we may see all the conflict, but we know that you insulate us from that. Jesus, what you said, in this world, you'll have trouble. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. We need to be of, in that place of, but be of good cheer. Because God, you're still there. I pray for every person that, that may be listening to this that said, God, I, I have felt like I've disobeyed you. God, help them. Today's a brand new day. Don't let them believe the lie. The devil says, well, we'll get all this straightened out tomorrow. Because one thing I've discovered when we say tomorrow, tomorrow never comes. Right now, today is the day of salvation. In other words, today is the day to make things right in our lives. Whether we're not following you or whether we're not just, we're not fully engaged. God, help us to be fully engaged, our lives aligned with your word. And I know when we do that, we will find the joy that we've just, we've read about in scripture tonight. Be with us now, Jesus, in your name we pray, amen. Listen, if you need prayer, or you say, Pastor, I'd like to connect with, with Christian Life Center, you can email us at clc at clconline.org, and we'll get back with you very quickly. You say, Pastor, I'd like someone to pray with me. If you go to our website, CLC Online. Um, you, when you go to that website, you're going to see a tab at the top that just says prayer. You can click on that. That's our prayer wall. You can put your prayer request there. Guess what? We pray for you. You, say, you may say, hey, I need somebody to reach out to me and contact me and pray with you. Put that down. We will call you. We'll get in contact with you. Remember, we always like to say this here at Christian Life Center. It's a sort of something that I say over my life all the time. If I'm following Christ the way I should, and I've been obedient to his word, and I'm submitting my life to him, I can always be assured of this. The best is yet to come. God bless you. Have a great day.